Hello everybody and welcome to Insider's Guide. Today we're finishing out our discussion of Mammoth Mountain with the extreme terrain sections of the resort, the summit and the outpost. If you haven't already, you'll want to check out the other three parts to hear about all the rest of the resort. So with that, let's finish an Insider's Guide to Ski Resorts, Mammoth. We'll start at the outpost, which you can see here on the far right side of the map. It's the back side of the resort. The outpost has two double chairs, chair 13 and chair 14. These lifts are nice because they are secluded, meaning they're not as busy as the rest of the resort. The downside, however, is that they are old, long, slow doubles that can have painfully long ride times. While chair 13 rarely has a line at all, chair 14 can get lines from 5 to 10 minutes only on the busiest days. The blues by chair 13, training wheels, oops, and surprise are amazing and isolated on a powder day during the week, just like those by chair 12, which we discussed in part C. Both outpost chairlifts service mostly blue groomers, but chair 14 also gives great access to some backside extremes. This section of Roadrunner runs across the entire backside. It's pretty narrow and not very enjoyable. I don't recommend skiing it unless for some reason you absolutely need to get back to the front side and can't take chair 13. Roadrunner as a whole is narrow, flat, and annoying. It goes all the way top to bottom, but in the most roundabout way possible. I only use it to get from the gondola to whatever other run I want to get to, and never stay on any longer than I have to. I would advise that you do the same. Accessible by taking chair 14, Ariba is the best run for intermediates looking for a groomed wide open bowl. Ariba and this other run, Santiago, are great intermediate laps, although Santiago is groomed less often than Ariba. This whole gladed area beneath and around chair 14 is called outpost glades. A lot of the trees are dead here, which gives the run a, well, unique feeling. There are practically endless lines you can take through outpost glades, but some of them are so tight that they are practically unskiable. Above Roadrunner and beneath chair 14 is a run called Dos Passos. It hasn't been designated on the trail map for over 40 years, and it needs a lot of snow to be skiable, but it's a fun challenge when it's good. It's shoot, with a huge cliff defining it on the left. It's right under the chair, so if you mess up, you'll have the whole lift watching you. Additionally, there are some truly extreme unnamed runs on the lookers right of this cliff area, loosely defined as the vegetable chutes. They are rarely skiable. Over on the left side of the lift, there's another line called Scooter Pie, which is the only way to get to Star Chute without hiking. Star Chute is a very short, steep series of chutes that are accessible by hiking along this ridge from the top of Chair 12. If you stick to your far left when coming down Roadrunner from Chair 14, you'll hit the lower half of Red's Lake Run right on the ski boundary. If you want the whole run, you'll have to come from 23 or the gondola. As a whole, the Chair 12, 13, 14 area is one of the best places in the resort for intermediates because of how many good runs there are and the lower crowds compared to the rest of the mountain. If you continue to your left as you come down Red's Lake Run, you'll get to Santiago Bowl, one of the steepest single blacks on the mountain. Santiago Bowl doesn't get ridden very often, but can get windswept and icy. If you keep to the far left of Santiago Bowl, you'll hit a groomed hike that takes you to the Hemlocks. The hike takes about 10 minutes and leads to some truly insane lines through trees and cliffs. On good snow years, the park crew builds kickers on trees that stick out of the run, hence the little terrain park symbol on the map. The outpost also has the best convenient on-mountain food, with really good grilled cheese and soups. Their heirloom tomato grilled cheese is very satisfying to eat while watching people send the hemlocks on a bluebird day. Switching back to the front side, something that can be difficult to discern is that the top of lifts 9, 5, and 3 are all sort of false summits as there is a large gully behind them that all of the summit runs flow into. You can ski into this gully from the top of these three lifts. It is hard to paint a trail map that depicts something like that, but just be aware that the summit runs flow down behind those chair lifts, not to them. Now I'll talk in depth about the summit. A quick little PSA before we get into the run by run in earnest. This will sound a bit harsh, but this is both for your safety and so that the people who come after you have a fair chance. If you're going to ski the chutes, ski them like you belong. Stop doing all this little side slip stuff, scraping all the snow off and making it impossible for anyone after you to ski it. If you're not going to ski the chutes properly, don't ski them. There is plenty of other difficult terrain for you to do, and you can still brag that you ski to summit double black, but Leave the shoots to the true experts. The summit is home to the hardest runs on the mountain. However, on bluebird days, going up the gondola is something I would recommend to everyone for the views from the top, even if you have to ride the gondola back down because you can't ski the blacks off the top. There's no shame in that. 
The summit is served by the Panorama Gondola, which also has a mid-station at the base of Facelift Express, as discussed in the previous video, and the legendary Chair 23. Most of the runs are on the west side of the summit. We'll start with the runs solely served by the gondola. Directly to the right of the summit building is Climax. Climax is one of the most wide open bowls at any resort and develops moguls if it hasn't snowed in a few days. It requires a daunting cornice drop in, but once you get in, it mellows out a bit. In lower snow years or early season, there are also a series of chutes at the bottom aptly named Climax Chutes. They aren't very long, but the harder lines can be pretty narrow. First tracks on Climax is one of the best experiences you'll get. Hangman's Hollow is an hourglass shaped chute with a pitch of over 45 degrees. In the middle is a choke point that, depending on the snow year, can be as narrow as the length of your skis or wider than a bus. Further down Upper Roadrunner is MJB's. MJB's is only open on great snow years and is a super short steep drop. Try saying that five times fast. That's pretty much all there is to it. Cornus Bowl is Mammoth's signature run. Everybody does it, including many who are not ready for it. It gets very congested because it is one of the few groomers off the summit. All you need to do is look up Mammoth Top to Bottom Run on the internet and the results will be flooded with great examples of why you should avoid the most overrated crowded run on the mountain. It's icy and looks like a graveyard with all the people that have fallen it. As such, I avoid it like the plague. These next runs are all serviced by Chair 23 as well as the gondola, and I recommend taking it instead of the gondola to access them as it is generally quicker. Wipeout and dropout chutes are long, steep chutes. Dropout chutes is usually a bit bumpier than wipeout chutes, and wipeout chutes is steeper at the top. Other than that, they are pretty similar, and you can even ski between them if you go over the ridge. Scotty's is just like Cornus Bowl without the human dodgeball component. If you're considering Cornus Bowl, just do Scotty's instead. It's usually groomed and is a perfect introductory run to the top of Mammoth. If you continue down Skyline, you'll get to Monument. Monument is steep, long, and wide open. You're probably beginning to see that steep, wide open bowls are a trend for the Mammoth Summit. After Monument, you'll walk a tiny bit uphill to get to the Paranoids. They are some of the steepest inbound runs in the country, being upwards of 45 degrees at the top. They get progressively harder as you go from P1, P2, P3, P4, and Mini P4. They all require drop-ins and have creep cracks. However, they mellow out to the steepness of a standard double black about halfway down. If you take P4, a 50 degree hair raising line, and go up the saddle right here, you'll look down on Philippe's, a precipitously narrow rock lined chute with a major choke point near the bottom. It's about as steep as Paranoid Flats. Philippe's is seriously dangerous and you shouldn't do it unless you are extremely confident in your skills. You very well may have to take your skis off at the bottom and walk down the choke point because it takes a ton of snow to fill in. Now we get to the hardest run on the mountain. It has been ranked among the hardest ski runs in the world. You get to Kiwi Flats by taking off your skis and walking past the entry to Mini P4. If it has snowed over 500 inches, you'll probably be able to ski right to the top of it. If it has snowed under 300 inches, don't even think about attempting Kiwi Flats. When you arrive at the entrance, you'll see a 600 foot couloir with a cliff in the middle of it at 50 to 55 degrees. I'm not kidding. You can take Paranoid or Kiwi Flats to get to the bottom of Star Chute, which I talked about earlier. From the bottom, you can hike up the chute and ski it from wherever you feel comfortable. Back over on the other side of the gondola, there's Huevos Grande, a very hard to find run akin to Hangman's Hollow. To get to it, skate over what looks like a big snow hill as soon as you start going down the ridge and hope you end up at the right spot. It's best to eye it out from below to try and pinpoint where the chute actually is. If you go too far to your right, you'll end up looking down at the easier chicken huevos. If you go too far to your left, you'll end up looking down the insane top of the world runs, such as Balls to the Wall, Juniors, and Cowboys. Huevos Grande, like all of the hardest runs at Mammoth, requires a ton of snow in order for the choke point at the top to be passable. Hike up the hill past the downward sloping section along the ridge and you'll get to Dave's Run, a steep ungroomed single black that's the hardest of its kind on the mountain. Dave's Run is pretty isolated and is the last run on the eastern side of the summit that can be lapped by the gondola. You can take the traverse from the top of Cloud 9 Express to McCoy Station and take the upper panorama gondola from there. It's a bit of work to lap Dave's but compared to some of the difficult terrain at other mountains it's totally worth it. Now, if you stick to the boundary rope and keep traversing for a while, you get to the top of head chutes. These chutes are all over 50 degrees and extremely narrow, but they're only about 100 feet long at the longest. They do have saplings sticking out in the middle, so you'll have to watch out for those. Keep traversing to get to Dragon's Back, a series of four chutes that are mellower than head chutes. 
they offer some of the most beautiful and isolated views on the mountain. The serenity you feel there is uncharacteristic of Mammoth. Then you'll get to Wazoo, one of the best expert glade runs on the mountain with some little shoots to drop into at the top. It mellows out considerably once you get about halfway down. Keep going along the ridge and the traverse will flatten out. You'll be at treeline now, but you just keep going until you are about parallel with Cloud9 Express. Almost nobody ever goes this far because it takes 20 minutes of ridgeline traversing to get to. The powder here on Dragon's Tail stays untouched for days, even weeks, if it has been that long since a storm. It's extremely steep and covered in trees, making it a very difficult run, but it's 100% worth it for the tenured expert. Alright, that wraps it up for Mammoth. If you haven't already, go check out parts A, B, and C to hear about the rest of Mammoth. Or go check out another episode of Insider's Guide, all about other fine resorts around the West. As always, please leave any questions down below. Thank you all so much for watching. All my love, I'm out.